Welcome to this video, a shell primer for linguistics. And in this video, we are going to have a brief look at the Linux shell, the command line, and how to use it. But please note, this is not a general introduction to Linux, but just a brief look, a primer on the shell. So what is a shell or the shell? So in very simple terms, the shell is a program that takes your commands and then hands these commands to the operating system. So the shell is a way of interacting with a computer, with your computer. Now, this term shell, fairly established, you might also hear things like terminal or the command line. And while there could be a graphical shell, usually if we talk about shells, these are command line interfaces that take text-based commands. So what does this look like? Well, usually you'll find something like this. So you'll get a shell, a command line, and then you can type commands here, for example, to the command date, and then the computer will return something to you. For example, here, the current date. And this is what we mean if we talk about a shell. There are many different shells, but we're not going into the details here. But it's important to note that in this video, I'm discussing Unix and Linux type shells. There is a very similar thing in Windows called either the command line, the CMD, or the more recent one, the PowerShell. And this, both of these work very similarly, but here we're looking at the Unix or Linux variant, and this is the most commonly used one or the most commonly used type of shell. And if you are running Mac OS, you'll find a very similar thing because Mac OS is based on Unix. Okay, so a shell takes commands, executes them, and then gives you some something back. Now, these shells could either exist on your local machine, but, and that's probably the more common case, is that you use them on a remote server. So here, for example, I'm using Putty. That's a client available for Windows, and I'm using this to connect to a remote server using SSH. And SSH is a protocol that allows you to use these command line interfaces, these shells, remotely. So here I'm SSHing into a server, and then on the server, which you can see to the right, I get the same interface. And that's when we use these types of command line interfaces a lot, if we interact with remote systems without a graphical interface. Now you might ask, why do we do this in text? We have graphical interfaces for a long time. It's a lot easier to use them. Well, shells, and I'm not going into too many details, have a couple of benefits. Most importantly, however, since they are text-based, you can script them, so you can write programs for them fairly easily. And also, it's very easy to use them remotely like this, where you, for example, have bandwidth limitations. And text usually works works fairly well. And also, this reduces a lot of overhead. And especially on servers, we usually don't use graphical user interfaces because they would just basically slow down the system, and we don't really need them because this is all we need usually. As I was saying, on the command line, on the shell, we execute commands. Now, there is lots to this, but we're going to break this down to the most simple and basic things. And please keep in mind that this is just an introduction. I'm skipping a lot of the nitty gritty details. And this is, to a certain extent, an oversimplification of things. OK, so if we run a command, commands usually are programs. And programs in the Unix and Linux world are usually binary files. So this is a file. And you're running this file. By default, if you run a command, this is executed in the current folder. So if you are in a shell, you are always within a folder. If you want to find your current folder, you can type pwd. So if you're in a folder, you're running a command, by default, that command will be run in that folder. After a command, a program has finished, you'll be back to the shell. So what does this look like? And we're going to go into a shell in a second to look at that. But basically, you type a command, and then you can also give this command an argument. So something to tell the command or to tell the program what exactly to do. And sometimes you can also hand it options. So for example, here we would hand the program or the command the option 42. Now keep in mind, if you want to exit or end the current program, you can always press CTRL control plus C and this will exit from the current program. Enough theory. Let's have a look at this in practice. All right. So here we are within a shell. And you can see the prompt here. So this is called a prompt. And these can look very different, but usually you'll find something like username at the computer you're on. And this is very helpful, especially if you work with various servers, because then sometimes you are not only working on your computer, but on many computers. So let's start by typing pwd, and this will tell us where we are. So currently, we are in a folder called slash home slash demo. 
and that's our home folder. That's where this user basically lives. Let's do an ls minus l, and this will now show us the content of that folder. It would list the folder, but list the directory. So in this directory, we have three more folders indicated here as blue and one file. The file is called uni. Now we could, for example, move into corpus, cd corpus, change directory to corpus. Now if we type pwd, we can see that we've changed the directory. Let's go back, cd dot dot gets us back. What I want to do is I want to look at this file, uni. And as we've just learned, commands are basically just files and these files can be programs. Uni is a program. So what we can do is we can now type dot slash uni. We need the dot slash to basically tell our system, hey, please now treat this file as a program. Please execute that file. I don't want to do anything else with it. I want to execute it. So if we type dot slash uni, this program will be run and we will get some hints here. So this is basically a little tutorial for how to do this. Dot uni is a tool that's useful if you want to find Unicode symbols. So let's use this. So, and we can see here, there's a usage hint. So we run uni and then a command and a flag. So the commands we have are identify, search, print, and emoji, and the flags are these. So let's try this. So let's run uni. Well, let me clear this first. We can type, you can always type clear and then you have a fresh, basically, shell again. So let's do dot slash uni. Now we do search, and now we give it a search term. And we're going to look for purple. And now what this tool will give us is basically all the Unicode symbols that contain purple in their name. And this could be, for example, very useful if you are cleaning up a text file or if you want to find a specific symbol, for example, if you're working with social media data. It's not about the tool. It's about the fact that this is how, generally speaking, these tools work. So you have the tool and then you can basically pass arguments, um, here commands and options to them. Often we can also do uh, minus minus help in many cases. And this will then give you a much more detailed documentation or help file. So here, uh, again, we've seen this uniqueries to Unicode database and then flags. So for example, uh, we could also do things like uh, emoji. If we just wanna look for emojis, let's try this um, emoji. And then for example, heart, now we will get all the heart emojis or all the emojis where there's heart in the um, name, right? So useful little tool. It's not about the tool, it's about how to use it. And then of course, just to show that initial example, we can just use date and this will give us that. And now you might wonder, well, why no dot slash here? That's because the dot slash is only needed if we want to execute a file or a program that's in the current folder. And then you can place programs into a specific folder where you don't need that dot slash thing. And then they're available everywhere. So if we were to go into corpus, you can see that in here, we don't have the .uni file. So if I were to run .uni, this would not work in here because that program is not here. However, I can run date and that's because date is in a sp special folder that contains programs that are used very often and that we need basically everywhere. And if they are there, we don't need the .slash. By the way, the tool you've just seen, uni, is available on GitHub and it is by Martin Turnoy. Now that we've basically done a little deep dive here, let's look at the file system first, because in order to understand all of this in a little more detail, we need to understand the file system. So on Linux systems, you'll always find a very similar file system hierarchy. So the idea is that your file system, basically your folders and files are in a tree structure. And here to the left, you can see part of the common tree structure. And this is the so-called root of the tree. So for example, bin and boot and dev and etc, they live in root. And root is indicated by a single slash. And now this is basically just a hierarchy. The folder corpus lives inside the folder demo, which is inside the folder home, and home ultimately is within root. To access this, we can use these paths. So for example, if we wanna to go to this folder corpus, we have to follow the tree or the path down. So slash home, then slash demo slash corpus. Now we can use a command called cd, change directory, to switch between directories. And an important one, and you can already just remember this, cd dot dot means go up one. So if we are in corpus and we type cd dot dot, we go up one folder. 
That would then be demo or one level, so to speak, in our hierarchy. Let's now look at a couple of important commands that we need if we are within the file system and if we want to basically move around in our system. So as I said, cd is change directory. The cd command takes an argument. That argument could either be a path, so you can basically jump between folders or between paths in your system, or something like dot dot to go back one level. Okay, if we are in a folder, well, we are technically always within a folder, but if we are within the folder that we want to be in, we can type ls to list the directory. So ls will basically show us all the files in that directory. Okay, so let's say we are now in a directory in which we want to create a file or a directory. There are two important commands here. So touch and then a file name will create an empty file and mkdir, make dir, and then a folder name will create an empty folder. What if we want to copy or move files? Well, two more commands, cp for copy and mv for move. And these both take two arguments. And the first one usually is the old file or the old location. And then the new one would be the new location and the new name. So for example, cp old slash file slash new slash file would copy slash old file to slash new file. And the same goes for mv. And we're going to look at this in a second. And then finally, if you want to delete files or directories, you can use the rm command. So rm, remove, file, or rm minus r, folder. And if you want to delete a folder, you need to add the r uh, flag minus r flag so that rm knows that you actually want to delete that folder. And that's kind of a little safety feature that's built in. So let's play around with these a little to get a feeling for them. Okay, we've already played around a little bit with navigating the file system, but let's try this out a little bit more. So again, pwd gives us our current folder. So we are in home demo. So let's move around a little. So let's do first an ls, a list directory. And if you do the ls without d minus l, you'll get this type of output. And if you do ls minus l, you'll get this uh, tabularized output with additional information uh, on who owns these files and when they were created and so on and so forth. Let's create a new folder in here. So let's do mkdir and then let's go with test. Now we're back at the shell. Let's type ls again. And we now have a new folder called test. So let's move into that folder, cd test. And now we are in test. And we can see this uh, also on the prompt. So the prompt now changed and it shows us where we are. The tilde symbol here indicates our home folder. So the tilde basically is slash home slash username. Basically, if I type pwp, the tilde indicates home demo because demo is our username. We could also do cd tilde and that would just get us into our home folder again um, if we were to do this. So let's go into the, the test folder again and let's create a file. So touch test.txt and now if I do lsl we can see that we now have one file in here that has no content. We just created an empty file. Okay, let's now say that we want to move this empty file to our home folder. So let's say move, that would be mv, and now we can do test.txt. So that's the current file, and now we want to move this up to our home folder. Now we have various options here. Think for a second what we could do. We want to move this to slash home slash demo. And we are now in slash home slash demo slash test. So one way would be to go dot dot, right? That would work. Another way would be to go home demo slash, right? Let's do this. So if we do this, now let's do this, ls, file is not here anymore. Let's move up one folder and now the test file is here. Okay, so now let's say we want to copy this file into the test folder. So instead of mv, we do cp test.txt. And by the way, you can always hit the tab button on your keyboard and that will basically autocomplete the current command or the current file name as best as the shell can manage. Okay, so cp test.txt, current file, and now we want to put this into test. So we can write test and just execute that. And now if we move into test, we can see that the file is in here. Let's move back up, ls, the file's also there. Awesome. Now that we've copied it into test, let's get rid of test.txt. So rm for remove test.txt and run this and we are golden. Okay, 
Now, for to clean up, finally, let's get rid of the test folder. So rm test. Oh, cannot remove test. It is a directory. If you want to remove the directory, you have to do rm minus r test. And now it is gone. And this is how you navigate the file system. Maybe as a last little demonstration here, if we go up to the root folder, so cd slash, so that's the, the root folder, that's the highest point in the hierarchy. And if we now run ls minus l, you can see all of these folders, right? And this is basically the whole file system. And then all our users, so for example, cd home. Now this is where all the user folders are. If we do an ls here, we can see that there are two users on the system. Demo, that's the user I'm using right now. And then there's also Ingo Kleiber, that's my personal user. This is how we navigate the system. Now that we know how we can navigate our file system, let's look at something a little bit more linguistic. Let's look at how we can work with text files, because that's something you might want to do. Or that's probably the thing you, you start by doing, especially if you're doing something like corpus linguistics. Basically, we're going to look at a few things here. There's an unlimited amount of things you could do, but these are a couple of good starting points. So we're first going to look at how to read and modify files using the more command and nano, a text editor. We're then going to use egrep to find text in a file using regular expressions. Then we're going to use the wc command for counting lines and words in a file. Then we're going to do a little bit of find and replace using set. And finally, we are going to query an XML document from the British National Corpus using XML Starlet. And there are many other tools you could use and you can do very complicated things, but we're going to use these examples so that you get a feeling for how this works. And then if you encounter a new tool, if you find a new tool, you have a basic idea of how to work with that. First, I need to go into my home folder, so cd tilde, and in here I have a folder called corpus. And in this folder, you'll see an XML file from the BNC, a text file called linux.txt, and a magical safe replace file that we're going to talk about in a minute or so. Let's start by looking at files. And then we're also going to modify them. So if you just want to look at the content of a file, you can do more. And let's look at this linux.txt file. And if we just execute that, more will just basically will just output the contents of this file. So here, the linux.txt file contains three lines, and this is basically from the Wikipedia, the Linux article. Now we could also do more uh, a00xml, and since this is a very long file, more will now also basically allow us by hitting the enter key to go through that file, right? And then I can just press Control C to exit more to end this thing, basically. Okay, what if you want to edit a file? Of course, there is a text editor. There are multiple text editors. And actually, there's lots of debate about which one is the best one and which one to use. A very simple one that's good for starters is nano. So you can type nano and then the file name. So linux.txt, and this will open up a text editor. And this is fairly straightforward. So we can move around here. We can basically add text like this. And then now this is different from what you're probably used to. Down here, we can see various commands. And if you want to save an exit, you have to use the command key. So this tilde symbol here is basically the command key or the control, uh, control, sorry, control key. So if we now want to exit this file, we can basically do just control X as it says down below. And now we are asked whether we want to modify i.e. save that file, I'm going to say no. So I press N to exit this again. Let's open this up again. We can see that we are back in here. And there are a couple of tools here. So for example, we can look for files by, for example, typing control W, and then we can also do a search. So for example, Linux, and then we end up here where Linux is, right? Okay, so nano, great, simple text editor. Okay, let's move on. The second thing you want to do is, and let me clear this for a second, we want to use regular expressions to find something, right? We can use egrep, and egrep is a tool that allows us to search in files. And we're going to use egrep. And if I, if I just run this, we get this little usage note here. Again, we can also run help, and then you can see all the commands. It's a fairly complex tool, so there's lots of documentation here. But what we are going to do is we are going to use the minus O flag, only matching, show only the part of a line matching the pattern. And you'll see what this does in a second. So let's run egrep minus O. Now we give this a pattern, a regular expression. And let's say 
we want to look for the word Linux. Let's do something very simple. So let's do Linux. We don't need that slash here in the file linux.txt. Very straightforward, not even a regular expression yet. Um, and we get three Linuxes back. Okay, let's do something more complicated. Let's say we wanna find all the words that are longer than 10 characters. So let's write a little regular expression for that. It's not perfect, but it's more of a demonstration. And this is also a tutorial on regular expressions. So backslash w plus 10 comma, and let's run this. And what we get back is only one match and that's distribution. Now, what does D minus O do? If we remove D minus O and run this, we will get the whole line that matched, basically. And interestingly, this can then also be used as a tiny concordancer, as an impromptu concordancer if you want to do it like that. So if you, for example, want to look for something like is, you could, you could do something like this. Now, of course, this is not perfect because this also matches the is in distribution. So let's add a word boundary in front and a word boundary at the back run this again. Now we get two hits, two matches. And since we don't use the minus O command, we see the whole line. Awesome. Okay. Let's now try to count lines and words in a file. And here we can use the WC command and the WC command, if I just run it, nothing happens. So I'm exiting out of here. So let's do WC minus minus help. And now we get a little bit more information. So the idea is that we hand this a file and I can show you. So vc linux.txt, and this will now return a fairly cryptic output, 326165. What this tells you is that this file has three lines, 26 words or tokens, and 165 bytes. Okay, what if we just want the line numbers? We can use vc minus l linux.txt, and then we get just the line numbers. Useful little tool if you want to estimate, for example, the tokens in a corpus or the tokens in a file. It's not perfect, but it works quite well. And VC minus L can be used to count lines in any type of thing. So fairly useful. Okay, now let's do a search and replace. And to do that, we're going to use set. And set is a incredibly powerful tool, um, but we're going to use it, use it for its most basic feature. So let's use sed and basically sed is very good for replacing things and it's it's also based on regular expressions so what it looks like is sed s and then you do, you do basically old new um and then the file name now of course uh, old is probably not in this so let's go with linux and let's say we want to replace linux with all uppercase linux and if i run this i get back the text but with this modification. If I run set with minus i, it will just replace it within the file. So if I run this, I get no output, but if I now use more linux.txt, I can see that now in this file, this has been changed. Let's revert this by basically doing the opposite, right? So let's do this and now do more linux.txt and now everything's back to how we wanted it. All right, this is great, very useful. And of course you can run this on multiple files. Okay, finally, let's use command line tools to play with XML and to query an XML document. So if you remember in here, we have a a00.xml from the British National Corpus. Now we can use another tool, XML Starlet. And XML Starlet is not there by default. You have to install it. I'm not going to discuss installing tools in this video, but if you Google XML Starlet, you'll find basically a tutorial on how to do this. It's fairly easy to do it. XML Starlet is um, a very powerful tool that allows you to do many things with XML documents. So editing them, uh, validating them, formatting them, converting XML, and so on and so forth. It's a very powerful tool. What we're going to do is we're only going to use the select feature. So we are basically going to query the XML document using XPath. Again, I'm not going to, to discuss XPath, but XPath can be used to find specific elements in an XML document. Okay, so let's do this. So XML starlet cell, and now we need uh, two flags minus T minus V minus V is so that it prints. And now we can basically give it an X path. And what we want to do for this example is we want to look for words that have the part of speech tag adjective. So we are looking for an element 
W. And that element W also needs to have the attribute POS equals adjective. And this is straight up from the BNC, um, from the way the BNC is annotated in XML. And we want to do this in a00.xml. And if we run this, we'll get back a list of all the elements with the tag W and the attribute POS equals adjective. We could also, of course, look at other things here, or we could just uh, get rid of this and then just get look at all the words. Or similarly, if we want to look at sentences, we can, of course, also do that based on the XML. So very powerful, and we can use this to browse or search within XML Corpora. Very cool. Okay, so we've now worked with individual commands, and now we maybe want to write the output to a new file. And on the shell, this is very easy. So we can use the greater and smaller symbols here to either read or write to a file. So for example, if we want to write our word count for the linux.txt file into a results.txt file, we can simply do the command and then a greater than symbol and then the file name in which we want to write this. So if we would run this command, wc linux.txt greater than results.txt, the output of that command would end up in that results file. And then similarly, you can use double greater than to append to a file. So if you want to add to an existing file, and then the same way you could read from a file. Even more interestingly, we can use piping on the shell, and that's a very powerful concept. That's a little hard to grasp at first, but it's very powerful. So the idea is we can use the pipe symbol to basically take the output of one command and then hand this to another tool. So here, for example, we use XML starlet, just as we've done before, to find all the adjectives in this A00 file. And then we're using the pipe symbol to basically pipe this output into WC minus L. And we can use this then to count the lines and ultimately then to count the adjectives. Now, you can basically add as many pipes as you want to. So you can basically put commands back to back and pass the output of one tool to the, to the next, to the next, to the next, to the next. And you can build very powerful pipelines. That's why it's called piping based, based on that. And, and then these are often called one-liners and you can find them online. There are a couple of very crazy ones. And some people take pride in building highly complex one-liners where data is piped from one tool to the other until they get where, to, to where they, to where they want to go. And this is a very powerful concept. Uh, because this way we can basically combine the powers of individual tools. In the Unix and Linux philosophy, the idea is that individual tools usually only do one thing. They do this thing very, very well. And then the idea is to connect tools together to build power, more powerful, more powerful things. Now, this is not a great example here because XML Starlet actually has tools built in to count. So this is not a perfect example, but it's a good example of, of how piping works. Let's have a look at that. Okay, so let's try these two things out. So the first thing is writing to a file. Let's go with WC again. So WC, linux.txt, we're still in the corpus folder. If I just run this, the output is basically uh, printed to me, I get the output. Now let's say I wanna save this result. So I'm going to use the greater as symbol, and then I'm going to do result.txt. Now I don't get back anything because the output is actually being put into that file, but now I can do more result.txt and in that file, the output is now stored. This is very useful. Now, interestingly, if I do uh, greater, greater to that, and then look at this, this will be appended. So now we have this just added to the end of the file. And if we just do one greater as symbol, whatever is in that file is then being replaced. If I now look at the results.txt again, it will only be one line. Okay, the more interesting concept is now piping. Let's try this again with the XML starlet example. So let's do XML starlet, and this is basically the exact same thing we've been doing before. So let's uh, take this word at POS equals adjective example again in the a00.xml. All right, so what this will give us is a, well, each instance of that in one line. Now we know that we can use wc to count lines, right? But 
WC does not necessarily only take files, it takes text, right? So we can basically now take the output from XML Starlet and pipe this into another tool. So this then ultimately looks like this. So XML Starlet cell minus T, that's the whole XML one. And then I'm piping this into this new command, WC minus L. And now I just get the number, the count for all the adjectives. So can we go further? Sure, so we could add another pipe and then another command here, but we could now also use the greater S symbol to store that. So let's say number of adjectives.txt and save that. And now if I do more number of adjectives.txt, we have stored this result here. So this is a very useful concept. Okay, now finally, we can also use what we've learned to build our own little programs. And this is called shell scripting. So a shell script is a text file that contains a number of commands, and these are then executed in sequence. And we can do this to build small but powerful programs. Here, for example, we built a little program that's called safe replace.sh. That's just by convention. So basically, we create a text file. We call the text file safe replace.sh. Could give it any name as long as there's sh in the end. And even that is not something you have to do, but it's convention. And then in that file, we basically have our commands. The first line will look a bit a little bit strange. There's a shebang. That's what this uh, hash symbol and then the exclamation mark is called. And then slash bin slash sh. And that basically points the system towards the shell. Slash bin slash sh is actually the shell. That's the program that we're using in the background. And then we're basically giving it commands. So what does this, com what does this tool do? Pause this video for a second, go through these three lines and try to figure out what happens here. I'm going to count down from one to three and then I'm going to tell you. So one, two, three. Okay, so the idea is this tool will take in three arguments. One, two, and three. And you can access these within a shell script using the dollar symbol. So for example, if we call safe replace Linux, Linux, Linux.txt, the first thing we will do is we will copy that file Linux.txt to a new file called Linux.txt.backup. Then we're going to do a replacement using SID, and we're going to replace the first argument with the second argument in place, so the file will change, so Linux.txt will change. And then ultimately, we're going to print something, we're going to let the user know that one has been replaced with two. And now we can use this little tool, we can run this as our own little command to do this. And now we have a tool that does replacements, and if something goes wrong, if we make a mistake, we still have a backup of the original file. Not the greatest tool on the planet, but possibly useful. Let's now look at this particular shell script. And this is what I've been showing you before. Uh, let me delete the number of adjectives and the results of txt. And you can basically use the rm command and then give it the number of files to delete. So if I do this and then run ls again, um, they are all gone. Okay, let's have a look at the save replace.sh. And I'm going to open this up using nano. And this is what it looks like. It's exactly what you've seen in the slides. So this is the first line indicating what we want to use to run this. So these commands are, if we execute the script, run using the program sh in the folder binary. That's a shell. Okay, so what do we do here? First of all, $3 is the third argument. So if I do something like save replace.sh123, right? Three arguments, these will be $123. Okay, so first thing is we use the command cp copy and we take the file name and then we store this, but we add backup in the end so that we now have a copy of this file. Then we're going to use sid using the in place option and we're going to replace one with two. And then of course, on which file are we doing this? On file, on the file specified in dollar sign three. And then we're printing or we're echoing that one has been replaced with two so that the user knows what is happening. All right. Let's try this out. So we can run this uh, dot slash save replace. So let's do this and let's replace Linux with Linux in the file linux.txt. Run this. Okay, so we get our output. Linux has been replaced with Linux. And now let's do an ls. And this new file has been created. So now let's look at the two files. So more 
linux.txt. The replacement has been made. And now let's look at the linux.txt.backup. And this is the old file. So let's say we don't like our changes. We want to go back. We made a mistake. We can now just mo use move to replace them. So let's move linux.txt.backup and put this as linux.txt. And if I do this, now print ls, we can see that we've moved that file. So linux.txt.backup is gone now. And while moving, we've also renamed it to linux.txt. So now if we do more linux.txt, all back to as it was. Okay, finally, let's look at complex command line interfaces and the interactive mode. So far, we've basically only looked at single commands. They might be complex and they might be piped into each other, but there is a whole different world with some tools that have what's often called interactive mode. So here, for example, we have CQP, part of the Open Corpus workbench, and CQP is basically a tool to access, query, and work with Corpora. Now, the interesting bit is if we call CQP, we are, so to speak, in the program, and we get our own interface. So if we run CQP, we will get our own interface and we can then type in commands, but these commands will only work within the context of CQP. And that's what's called interactive mode. So we're not just running one command and then we're back to the shell, but we are within a program and we can basically type in commands that are then run within this tool. That's of course a little bit different than just typing in individual commands. And then we can exit this program and then ultimately we will be back to the shell. Let's look at CQP as an example, as a corpus linguistic example for an interactive command line interface. So I've downloaded the Dickens 1.0 corpus from the CQP corpus workbench people. And I'm going to go into this folder and now we can run CQP within this folder. So the way you do this is CQP minus EC minus R registry minus D Dickens the corpus name, and this is from their documentation. So this is not something you would remember. Some things you will remember because you use it very often. This is probably something you'll look up in their documentation. So if we run this, we basically enter this tool, and now we left the shell. Well, we are still in the shell, but um, we, now, we are now within this program, to put it very bluntly. As you can see, also the prompt has changed. So we are now not demo at Ingo Kleiber PC anymore, but we're now Dickens, right? And we can now run CQP commands in here. Since this is not a CQP tutorial, we're not going to write CQP queries here, but we're going to do a very simple lookup. So let's say we wanna just look for a lamplight in this corpus. I'm going to run this, and then we get these two concordance lines back. Okay, um, so far so good, but as you can see, we're now not back at our command line, but we are still within CQP, as you can see by the prompt. So now we could also, for example, look for a car or for a cat, right? And we're basically staying within CQP. And this is what's meant by interactive mode, that we are now interacting with this tool and we're not just sending individual commands. And I think I type exit to get out of this. All right, so this was this little introduction to the Linux shell. And of course, there's lots more to find and to look at, but this was a brief introduction. Don't be afraid if you see these types of interfaces, they are not as bad as you think. They're actually very powerful. And if you master them, or at least if you get some, some basic intuition about them, you can do some very powerful things with them and also save a lot of time, for example, if you write your own little shell scripts.